Truly, this is a day that the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. I want to welcome each of you to Georgetown Presbyterian Church on this Sunday morning for morning worship. If you happen to be a visitor with us today, we say a word of special welcome to you. We're glad you're here, that you have found us, that someone has perhaps invited you to be here on this day, but we're glad that you are, and do ask that those seated toward the center aisle begin to pass down your pew and back up again, if that is uh, a possibility for you to do, uh, the ritual of friendship, Pat, and to give us, in addition to your name, some way of being in touch with you, whether by email or by telephone, but we're glad again that you're here. A couple of things real quickly to an announce, uh, the men's breakfast and Bible study will not meet this coming Wednesday morning as we normally do, so we will invite you to come and join us next week. Um, our children's choir is going to be singing two weeks from today on October the 30th, so that is something to look forward to, and uh, we uh, are thankful for children's voices and uh, looking forward to that time of hearing them singing in worship on the 30th. Congregational Care Lunch, you're asked to sign up again for that. It will take place again on November the 1st at noon, so make your reservations. There is a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board uh, in the hallway uh, directly behind me. And also, there's a way in which uh, some of you have been asking about ways of being of help with disaster relief, especially as it relates to the southwest coast of Florida, where Hurricane Ian did all kinds of uh, destruction uh, on, in that place. And so there are two ways that you can do that, and that is uh, in your bulletin as well at the very bottom por portion of the announcement section of the bulletin. So be mindful of that as well. Through Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, you can be a source of great help to people in a time of need. This time I would like to recognize Jody Tamsberg, Jr., who is our stewardship chairman for this year. He has a word or two to share with you on this day. Jody. Good morning. Good morning. Golf course is a little crowded this morning, not bad. Um, as we progress in our stewardship season, as Christians, we're reminded of the Great Commission. The scripture spells out the central purpose of our church, and as believers, we're saved and we're to work to grow his kingdom. 
we're commanded to share the gospel. Dick. <clears throat> Scripture teaches us that believers are to obey and share the gospel through support of our church and missions. Dick. <clears throat> Stewardship is supporting ministries no matter the economy, inflation, gas prices, groceries. Dick. Whoa, who, who is that? What is that? Dick, it is I, your heavenly father. God, sir? Relax, Dick. I am simply checking in with you. How are you, Dickie? How's it going? May I call you Dickie? Uh, yes, sir. You may call me anything you'd like. Um, <laughs> I'm well. I'm well. Things down here are interesting, different. Uh, feels like a changing world, but you already know that, of course. Dick, let's talk about us. I would like to talk about you and me, catch up on our relationship. Dick, do you remember every day how much I care for you? And do you think about the value of our relationship? I think I know, uh, and it is really everything to me. Really? I have promised you my steadfast love and mercies are new every morning. But Dick, do you truly realize the value of my blessings upon you? Why don't we count up? Yes, sir, but, but those really are worth everything to me. Well, Dickie, what are they? Let's list them to determine what really is the value to you. Well, I have a good bit of money in the bank. I have over $10,000 in the bank. Good. $10,000. What else? Um, that's pretty much it. That's about all I have. Nothing more? Well, I have, I have a few dollars in my pocket. How much? Uh, let me see here. 30, 40, 60, 80, that's something over $100. That's fine. What else do you have? Well, pretty much nothing. That's about it. Are those golf clothes? Does that mean you have golf clubs? Yes, I do have golf clubs. I enjoy golf. Then your golf clubs go on our list. By the way, my son, the angels really enjoyed your golf cart splash into the lake. Well, what else do you have? Where do you live? Well, I live in my house. Oh, so you do have a house too, putting it on my list also. You mean now I have to live in my camper? So you have a camper. The camper too. What else? Uh, but I just fully stocked that camper with supplies, and at today's prices, I mean, that's a lot of money. Good. Adding the supplies to the list. But then I'll have to sleep in my car. You have a car? Well, yes, actually, I have two cars. And both of them are full of gas, and um, gas is really expensive right now. Now both cars are added to list. What else do you have? Jeez, God, you've already taken my money, my clubs, my house, my camper, my cars. What more are you asking? Well, are you alone in this world? No, I have a wife and two children. Oh, listing your wife and children also. What else? Well, I would give my wife to you. Um, <clears throat> but, but, um, but all our grandchildren do need, to, need her. Who else would feed them? Who else would cook for us? So you have grandchildren and food. All that goes on the list, too. What else? The food, too. But you probably know Helen eats more than she looks like, so it's, it's a lot of food. I really don't have much left. Uh, I'm left alone now. Oh, I almost forgot. You, yourself, too. You go on the list. Everything becomes mine, just as you are mine. Are you really leaving me without anything? Dick, I simply wanted to remind you that you were created and placed here in this world not as an owner, but as a steward. And yes, you may continue as the steward of all these blessings. I bless my people with many blessings as my love gifts to them. 
always remember that stewardship is the use of God-given resources for the accomplishment of God-given goals. Dick, you are my child. I love you, and I'll be keeping an eye on you. Stay in touch. Yes, sir. Thank you, God. Please join with me now as we call ourselves to worship. We lift up our eyes to the hills. From where will our help come? Our help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. The Lord will keep us from all evil. The Lord will keep our lives. The Lord will keep our going out and our coming in in this time forth. Let us pray. Lord of bounty and harvest, we pray that you would bring us to fullness of love and commitment in the person of Jesus Christ. Christ is the one who unites us as one people amid the variety of spiritual gifts that we share with the world and with each other. He is the one who died and was raised to new life in a way not completely unlike the plucking up of planter of summer crops makes room for the new planting of the spring. Move within us by your Holy Spirit in this time of worship that we might know and be known by you and follow the righteous path of the Savior who taught us as disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. confess our sins first together in unison prayer and then in a moment of personal silent confession. Please join with me. Almighty God, after the manner of Jesus Christ, you called us to be a servant people, but we don't always do what you command. 
We are often silent when we should speak and useless when we could be useful. We sometimes ignore the needs of our neighbors because we are so focused on our own concerns. Have mercy on us, O oh God. Forgive us and free us from sin. All this we pray in the merciful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. People of God, Jesus Christ, who gave himself once and for all, forgives and saves us. Therefore, be reconciled to one another, holding fast to the confession of our hope in Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. time I would like to invite forward the children that are here on this day that they might have a time with children with Mr. Jim Lee. Anything that's on our heart. And we never have to. 
pay for that. And we understand, Jesus, that you paid that price for us with your life on the cross. And that's something we should never forget. We are ever thankful for your love and guidance, for your love and care. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you, my friend. pray. Draw us close, Holy Spirit, as the scriptures we read and the word is proclaimed. Let the word of faith be on our lips and in our hearts. Let all other words slip away. May there be one voice we hear today, the voice of truth and grace. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. Then chapter 4, verse 5. Let's listen for the word of the Lord. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have known sacred writings that are able to instruct you for in salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that the person of God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. And verse 4, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and view of his appearing and his kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message, be persistent, whether the time is favorable or unfavorable, convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. For the time is coming when the people will not put up with sound teaching, but having their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. As for you, be sober in everything, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, carry out your ministry fully, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our second reading of scripture on this morning is from Luke's Gospel, the 18th chapter. The lectionary gospel reading for the morning, the parable of the widow and the unjust judge. Listen for God's word. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had any respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused. Later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. As I've read and reflected upon Jesus' parable about the widow and the unjust judge this past week, I began to recall a couple of scenes from that powerful film made about the life of Mahatma Gandhi, a man commonly referred to as the father of modern India. If you have never seen Gandhi the movie before, you would have, if you have ever seen it before, you would probably have a lot of difficulty forgetting the scene of a protest that took place in the year 1930 at the Darsana Salt Works. The salt works throughout India at that time were controlled exclusively by colonial British interest, and Gandhi and many others felt the mass of people in India should have more ready access to such a staple in their diets as salt, especially one so desperately needed by blue-collar workers toiling under the tropical sun of Indian skies. A nonviolent protest was organized in which row after row of men would come forward as if to gain admittance to the gates of the salt production facility in the town of Darsana. The gates were heavily fortified with soldiers bearing clubs. And the protesters, every single one of them, were unarmed, but they were persistent and committed to their cause. Row after row after row of protesters came forward, and row after row were clubbed down by the soldiers. As one row of protesters fell to the ground bleeding, another would take its place. Now in the movie, they, they only showed just a few brief moments of this taking place, and it was hard to watch. But in real life, this actually went on. This was true history. This actually went on for hour after hour into the night. And all of this time, not one single protester so much as lifted his arm to shield himself from the blows but uh, not one turned around in fear to, gr to flee the gruesome scene either. Not one gave up uh, in this seemingly hopeless and helpless situation. Not one person turned back. Several international journalists were on hand and they reported what they had seen. And from this very moment, any informed person with half of a heart could see that the forces of British power had no real moral ground on which to stand. In many ways, this was a tipping point, an event that helped to turn the tide of world opinion in a conflict that ended some years later with India's independence as a nation. I also recall that riveting scene in which Gandhi is speaking with a British military official in the movie about the fate of what lay ahead as the conflict ensued. Gandhi spoke of the persistence of the Indian people and its commitment to self-rule. At one point, the British official said to Gandhi, well, you don't think we're just going to turn around and walk out of India, do you? To this, Gandhi replied, yes, in the end, you will walk out. Because 100,000 Englishmen simply cannot control 350 million Indians if those Indians refuse to cooperate. 
Gandhi's point, I think, was that with patience and persistence, the righteousness of their cause, this cause upon which they had staked their lives, he had staked his life and his reputation, that they would emerge triumphant, no matter how dark the present situation might seem to be. When Jesus spoke his parable about a certain judge and a certain widow, he was painting a picture of two polar opposites. On the one hand, there is a judge who neither fears God nor has any regard at all for people. Concerning the latter, it would really be more accurate to say in that Middle Eastern world that he has no shame rather than he simply lacks respect. He has no shame at all. There is really no way at all to make any appeal to him. He's shameless. He's a shameless man in a shame-based culture where honor and reputation mean everything. It is likely that the only way to get his attention or to win his favor is to offer him a bribe. It's just as bad or, or maybe worse that he doesn't fear God. We should remember that there was no separation of church and state as such in Jesus' world. Judges ruled largely based upon religious law. Civil law, in a sense, was religious law for the most part. The judge must have forgotten or may never have heard the words that the Jewish historian in 2 Chronicles gives when an account is, is told of a time that King Jehoshaphat in ancient Judah had spoken to some local judges. And King Jehoshaphat had said this to those local judges. Consider what you are doing, for you judge not on behalf of human beings, but on the Lord's behalf. Let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take care what you do, for there is no perversion of justice with the law, with the Lord our God, or partiality, or taking of bribes. So maybe the unjust judge, did you get that unjust judge? Maybe the unjust judge is simply blinded by his power and his lust for personal gain. But because he neither fears God nor has any shame whatsoever regarding his dealing with other people, he is clearly a reprehensible behavior. He's just a, an awful man in every respect. On the other hand, Jesus speaks of a widow who asks for some vindication, who seeks justice against her unnamed adversary. No details pertaining to her case are really given to us, but none need be. She is a widow, the very symbol of helplessness and need in biblical language. She runs the risk of homelessness and even starvation if her needs are not met. There were all sorts of customs and practices in place based upon God's law aimed at bringing relief for the needs of widows and orphans. We read about that quite often in Scripture. She is fully aware of this, and she makes an appeal to the judge. But in his lawless state, he refuses to hear her case. And she certainly doesn't have the resources available to offer him any sort of bribe. In this, we can assume that she's not asking for things that are unnecessary for her survival. She doesn't want frivolous items. It's not an appeal for the yacht and the condo down in Boca Raton. Her appeal is one made for basic necessities, the things that may keep her alive in a time of dire need. So the parable presents two polar opposites. There is a judge who is as lacking in righteousness as one can be, but who has also been endowed with temporal power, a big kind of temporal power in that community. He's a judge. And there is a widow who is as righteous, not sinless, but righteous in her cause as she can be, and yet absolutely lacking in power as power could be defined by worldly standards. Her appeal is to the justice of God, but the judge doesn't fear God and cannot be reached by anyone based on that because he is utterly shameless. The parable tells us that for a while the judge refused to hear her case, refused by so doing to grant her any morsel of justice. It appears that things are at something of an impasse. The widow keeps showing up at the courthouse, and the judge in his lawlessness keeps turning a deaf 
ear and the cold shoulder. She is persistent, but for a while, he is immovable and unmoved. We might wonder if she would just give up. Is there another judge in the land? Is there another person to whom she can turn? Will she become resigned to her fate like the widow at Zarephath and simply go home, turn her face to the wall and die alone? But the parable turns as the judge finally grows tired of the stalemate. From a literary perspective, parables often do turn their course by means of some soliloquy, a speech that someone makes to themselves that no one else can hear. And this one's no different. The parable tells us that the judge said to himself, though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone and no shame, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she won't wear me out by her continually coming. Note closely what's going on here. He freely admits that he has no fear of God. He has no shame for his own shameful conduct. He experiences no conversion. He's not blinded by the light on the road to Damascus. His heart is not strangely warmed. He's not coming down to the altar singing, just as I am, without one plea. Rather, he simply wants to get this woman off his back, out of his life. I don't want to bore you with too many labored analyses based upon the Greek language week after week, but there is consideration here of some language that is, I think, helpful and worthy of mention. What gets translated in this parable, in this translation at least, is wear me out, referring to the widow's persistent visits to the courtroom, is really a term from the sport of boxing, ancient boxing, literally meaning to strike a blow below the eye. If we wanted to translate this literally and more playfully, we might read that the judge is saying that he will grant her justice so that she won't give me a black eye, so that she won't punch my lights out by her continually coming. It is, if you think about it, a little bit of a somewhat comical image, the image of a widow knocking the tar out of this lawless judge. It may appeal a little bit to our visceral side. We never mind it so much when we watch a movie or we read a book and the bad guy gets smacked upside the head. We don't feel bad about that. But in the world of the parable, the widow would have known better than to resort to physical violence, no matter the righteousness of her cause. She would have been thrown out of the courtroom and never allowed to return to it had she resorted to violence. Her case would never, ever have been heard. It would have cost her any chance at all even the seemingly slim chance that she had for justice to be rendered. The phrase of blackening the eye was also used in ancient times to refer to a loss uh, or of, of damage to someone's reputation. We use the phrase even now as in, it gave the president a black eye to be caught in fill in the blank. But it doesn't really apply to the unjust judge in the parable since he doesn't care at all about his reputation so much as his place of power and the material gains that he can reap from it. Suffice it to say that the lawless judge simply wants the woman to go away, to get off his back and out of his life. She is giving him a headache and in a manner of speaking she has finally given him a black eye by wearing down his resolve to do nothing on her behalf. The judge's own words confirm that in the end, the widow has finally won this war of attrition. Now, lest we think that this is one of those things that used to happen way back in, in times of yore, but not so much nowadays, we should be reminded of those television news reporters who make a living on local news networks by exposing the injustices done to powerless and voiceless people in every community. They're usually uh, on shows, uh, features called something like Action Line or We're on Your Side, something like that. I remember seeing a news story on the Atlanta uh, news one night uh, when we lived there some years ago now, a, a local news story that highlighted the plight of a 93-year-old woman who lived in southwest Atlanta by the name of Edna. I don't remember her last name. For years, Edna had been trying to have something done about a vacant lot that was beside her property where her home stood. The, the lot was completely overgrown, filled with snakes and all kinds of vermin. 
Roots from some of the overgrown undergrowth had cracked her retaining wall. Limbs from trees that hadn't been trimmed in many years had blown into her yard, and one large limb did some fairly significant damage to her roof. The news reporter stated that they had done a similar report on the news uh, a few months earlier about Edna, but nothing had been done. Still nothing had been done. The reporter ended by stating that the property's owner had been contacted and threatened with a citation if nothing was done to clear the lot. I have no way of knowing whatever happened to Edna. I never heard a follow-up report subsequent to that one. But I do wonder if Edna ever received any justice in that matter, if her voice was ever heard. Jesus bids those who hear the parable to listen to what the unjust judge has to say. And then to realize how much, God, how much more God will do for those whom God has chosen when they cry out day and night for justice. In the end, this is a story about God and the divine capacity to bring justice. But it's also a story about our need as the people of God to continually be about the work of prayer. The parable ends with, uh, begins with an introduction that tells us as much. Jesus told the disciples a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. For me and for you, this is a message that I think is filled with hope. We all know that life isn't always a walk down easy street. The world is filled with injustice, and sometimes we are on the receiving end of injustice, and it hurts. As Christian people, we know that prayer is our open line of communication to God. But there are times when it may seem that our prayers go unanswered. If by unanswered, it, we mean to say that our own specific prayer requests are not fulfilled in the manner that we had hoped they would be. We can think of a hundred examples. I think of families praying for healing for their loved ones, even miraculous healing in times of critical illness and pending death. And I wonder if they are asking the question that many of us ask at some point in our lives, does prayer really work? Times it may seem that our prayers are answered for matters both great and small, and other times it may not. We hear people say, and may even have said ourselves, that God answered prayers we lifted up for the purchase or the sale of a new home, or the finding of a new job, or the acceptance into that college that we had hoped to attend, or that group that we had wanted, wanted to join and, and be a part of. I don't think that there's anything wrong with lifting such things to God so long as we don't blame God if the answer to that prayer is a no. However, we have heard people say that they prayed for or maybe even ourselves have prayed for things that are a bit more mundane than that. Things like getting that choice parking spot at the Walmart or an item of clothing that we didn't really need, but we desired. Or maybe for our team to win the game, that one probably applies to a few of us. The list goes on and on. We hear a lot of athletes giving God the credit for a victory on the field with the implication that, uh, that God didn't hear the prayers of the team that lost, assuming that the, the team that lost was praying for victory too, and I would imagine they were. Somehow, I think that there must be more important things for God to attend than that. Not so long ago, there was what I can only call a, a spiritual fad, much in fashion, around a fairly obscure but biblical prayer uttered by a man named Jabez. It can be found in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10. All kinds of books were written. A whole movement began that was aimed at interpreting this prayer and appropriating it largely for purposes, as, as I understood it, promoting a, a prosperity gospel, more often than not a, a material prosperity gospel. I'm not so sure God is about giving us all the toys that we want and think that we need. The gospel is based more upon our taking up our crosses and following in obedience and in humility more than God giving us a bunch of stuff. 
Our life in prayer with God is not based upon the assumption that God is a vending machine dispensing blessings that we think we need. God is not made in our image. Rather, we are made in God's image. But God does desire to give us what we truly need. God does seek out justice for the world and calls us to continual prayer regarding the basic necessities we have in life as well as for the needs of others. Truly, God knows our needs before we can even ask God to give them to us. Years ago now, the Rolling Stones sang that you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometimes, and I might add persist in prayer sometimes, you get what you need. Jesus once spoke a parable about a widow and an unjust, lawless judge. Now, justice was given to the wit widow, and it may have seemed for a time that none ever would be. But she knocked on the door until her knuckles were bleeding. She cried out for her case to be heard until her throat was parched and her voice was barely audible. She prayed for her needs to be met until at long last the judge gave in and justice was served. The war of attrition had been won. How much more then does God desire to give us and God's people everywhere the things that we most need? the things that God knows we need. Prayer does work when directed to God in this way. God does vindicate us. God does bring about divine justice. God is anything but an unjust judge. We might wonder, too, if in speaking this parable, Jesus was speaking of his own life and mission in a way. He was drawing near to Jerusalem and the inevitable fate that awaited him there. There would come a day not very far off that he would sense what lay ahead and would pray that a cup might pass from him, but also pray that God's will be done. Soon he would be nailed to a cross and suffer humiliation. Just before he died, he would pray that into God's hands his spirit would be commended. At the moment of his death, the sky grew dark and the earth shook. And it seemed that all was lost, that his prayers had gone unanswered. For three days, justice seemed to have taken the last train for the coast. But on that third day, on that third day, justice came. On that third day, he was vindicated, and the world has never been the same. You and I worship the God of how much more? So, we pray always, and we do not lose heart. To God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor, all praise, and all glory, now and forever. Amen. Let us turn to God in prayer. Gracious God of infinite love and providence, you have provided for the country we live in in so many times and in so many ways. You have given us an abundance of natural resources. You have blessed us with a diversity of people. You have indeed shed your grace on these United States. In this moment, we express our awe and our gratitude for the blessings that we have received as citizens of this nation. We pray for the citizens of other nations, places that are torn apart by strife and by war and disease. Lord, your strength and power allows you to come to the aid of those who seek your comfort. Many in this nation and other nations need to feel your presence abiding with them. Those who suffer from lack of food and shelter stand in need of your blessing. And we would petition you to bless them as you have blessed us. Lord, so many people live in homes in neighbor, neighborhoods that have been ravaged by violence. If it be your will, give these people protection and enable them to have a sense of renewed hope in their lives. Gracious God, we certainly lift up in prayer all of those who, whose uh, lives and property have been turned upside down by Hurricane Ian and other natural disasters by flooding, by high winds. I pray that you would be a source of, of care to those who are in need and that you would restore the things that they have as soon as that be possible. 
that you provide for basic necessities and that you allow the church to be empowered to be a part of that. Almighty God, people in our own community and even in this place need to catch a glimpse of your love, to feel your spirit dwelling within them. Pray that you would be with those who face long-term hospitalization or a prolonged period of confinement or lack of mobility. Be with those who are estranged from loved ones that if possible there might occur reconciliation. Give peace to those whose hearts are troubled that their spirits might find rest in you. Be with parents seeking to raise their children as members of your church that all wisdom and courage might be given to them. Be with youth who are facing pressures that compromise their faith and pray that you might be the final and lasting authority in their lives. Gracious Lord, we pray for ourselves that we might be able to follow you as obedient servants. Give us a sense of purpose in our lives that we might not fall prey to the competing claims of bad influences on our lives, whatever shape or form those influences may take. Have us to be chiefly influenced by your word and have us to live and to speak according to your Holy Spirit. Have us never cease to pray. And we pray now that you would be with us today and in all the days that lie ahead as we pray in Jesus' holy and righteous name. Amen. I invite you now to stand if you are able to do so as we say together the things we believe as God's people, saying together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. With joyful and thankful hearts at what God has done in our lives and what God continues to do in our lives day by day, let us now give unto God our tithes and offerings.
God, we pray that you would receive the gifts that we bring on this morning, that they might be fitting in your sight, that they might be used by us with the wisdom of the Spirit to provide for the needs in our community, in the larger world, and the needs of our congregation. We thank you for the ministry that we have and that we share. Pray that your blessing would rest upon each one of us today and every day. For it is in Jesus' risen name that we pray. Amen. his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you, give you peace both now and forevermore. Amen. A congregational meeting will begin in approximately five minutes.
I will call to order this meeting of the congregation of Georgetown Presbyterian Church and state that we do have a quorum present for conducting congregational business on this morning. Let us turn to God in prayer. Lord God, we are prayerful about many things. We are prayerful at the greatest times of life and at the worst. We pray that your spirit might attend to us, that it might be with us, because we know that your church is the bedrock of everything, that you have founded it upon the very firmest of foundations. And so it is that today we pray for your spirit. We pray for our congregation and our community. For it is in Jesus' loving name that we pray. Amen. I want to uh, just very briefly introduce to you uh, the Reverend Tony Larson. He is our guest this morning. He is uh, the pastor at the Trinity Presbyterian Church in Surfside Beach, and he also serves as the chair of the Committee on Ministry for the Presbytery of New Harmony. Today we have uh, one task, and that is to approve a dissolution agreement that has been approved by your session and also by the Committee on Ministry of the Presbytery, and the final approval lies with you, the congregation of Georgetown Presbyterian Church. And I'm going to ask that our ushers at this time begin to circulate copies of that agreement. And I'm going to give you just a moment or two to look over it before we begin to have any discussion about it. some for the choir as well. I'm going to ask that if you're a married couple for now, please share the document. Um, I think we have enough, but I didn't 